Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we have Mike Brown with us. He's the Director of Product Innovation with ATB Financial, the leading banking institution in Alberta and Canada. And Mike is leading um, the ecosystem there um, for decentralized identity, and he's building a whole range of activities, which will be really interesting to hear about. But before we talk about that, let me quick, quickly review with you in the second slide uh, what SSI Meetup is about. Basically, what we're trying to do here is that to empower the global SSI communities. That's why we're recording these um, sessions. And this is open to everyone. If you're interested in participating, please just reach out, reach out to me. Um, if you're doing something on the legal side of things, on the financial side of things, or on the community side of things, or if you're working on a project, or as Mike, you're building up a whole ecosystem, then um, I think everyone is really interested in hearing about that. And, and and please reach out. All this content is shared with the Creative Commons by Share Like License, which is basically um, open source license, which in, in this case means that any of the material that Mike is sharing here uh, will be shared with, with that license and you can reuse it and hopefully um, tell other people around the world um, how, how they're doing things in Alberta. And um, you just need to reference back that this is coming from, from Mike and ATB and also from SSI Meetup, and as, as with all the other presentations and webinars we've done so far um, at SSI Meetup. Um, at the end of the session, I'll be uploading the video and um, the PowerPoint slides um, to the blog post, so you will be able to download all that stuff. And during the presentation, please um, interrupt with any questions you have that makes the presentations more interesting, also for, for Mike. And yeah, Mike, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, everyone really looks really forward to, to see what you're doing in Alberta. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Alex. And thanks, everybody, for joining in for this webinar. Thanks, Alex, for arranging these. Um, you've curated a great uh, set of content. I'm happy to uh, contribute to this. So <clears throat> just wanted to open up by sharing a bit about ATB Financial. Uh, ATB Financial is a uh, operates in the province of Alberta in Canada, and we offer full banking services, uh, consumer banking, commercial banking, <clears throat> investment services, and the like. We've got over 5,000 team members and approximately just under 800,000 customers uh, around the province. We've been around for about 80 years. <clears throat> what makes us a bit unique um, kind of in the banking space, we're actually owned by the provincial government. Um, however, we don't operate um, too much like a government. We operate pretty independently. On the left-hand side of the screen, there is our, what we call the ATB story. And it's a 94-word story as to why we exist. And this helps guide what we do every day um, in serving our customers. And the reason I bring this up is there's a couple of uh, important lines in here that I think line up very well with the, the concept of, of self-sovereign identity. And you'll see happiness coming up a couple of times, um, you know, about making happiness deeper for Albertans and uh, creating happiness and why happiness is so important. And again, that ATB is more than a bank. So when I look at the idea of self-sovereign identity and the work we're doing in this space, really anchoring it in this area and the story of ATB is quite important for me. So this, to me, is a, a critical point that really helps drive what we do and really helps me justify why putting citizens and our customers at the center of their identity experience is so important. <clears throat> so a bit more background. Um, so for myself, as Alex mentioned, I'm Director of Product Innovation within ATB. We've got an innovation team of about 22 people of which blockchain is a portion of the work that we do. And I lead all of the work that we do in the blockchain space. And the reason I kind of bring this up is because we approach blockchain in a way that um, we understand that it's going to disrupt us and areas like identity are critical to that. So, you know, our basic thesis for blockchain is that in the future, banks will no longer control the flow of money. So if we start there and we understand that, you know, this is, the future state that we need to be prepared for, then the decisions we make today are how can we get prepared for it and what can we do differently that can help us be relevant in the future. Um, ATB has you know, been working in the blockchain space for about three years now. Uh, we did our first test of the Ripple network back in early 2016, and I joined ATB about two and a half years ago 
in this role uh, with a strict focus on blockchain. Early on in my uh, role here, <clears throat> identity was identif um, quickly identified as a, a key area for us to focus on, uh, one where we thought there'd be greater opportunity to have significant impact. And this is where I look at you know identity and basically that we have the opportunity to give the consumers back control over their identity. And by doing so, we believe that we're going to create new um, unimagined innovation that will be enabled through this type of digital identity and, and verified credentials such as they are at this point. So this is the premise to which we're working on. And as I mentioned, we've been working on this space for about two years now. So this is quite an important topic for us. Uh, we believe that the work we've done to date has um, really helped move us forward. And we believe that uh, the opportunities ahead of us are quite significant. So what I wanted to do in the discussion today was basically just take some time and, and step you through uh, the work we've done to date in this space, and then outline a bit of what's, um, what's ahead of us in the next 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> um, I guess it's reinforcing here the role of self-sovereign identity for Albertans. But the very first piece of work we did, um, so early on, we were doing some review and analysis and, and came across the Sovereign and the team at Evernim and were quite impressed with the approach they were taking and the establishment of the Sovereign Foundation. So <clears throat> we began looking at this to see how can we get more involved? How can we start to understand how the sovereign protocol and ledger works. So uh, another organization in Canada, TELUS. TELUS is a um, telecommunications company in Canada, providing both wired and wireless uh, services in Canada. So we worked with TELUS to go through a proof of concept so that we could each better understand how sovereign worked and what the potential would be. So we engaged with TELUS, uh, the first um, exercise we went through is we created a scenario where we would be issuing a bank relationship credential to a customer and that customer would then share that credential with TELUS for the purposes of account opening. So in doing this scenario, the first um, thing we had to go through and do was to you know, identify what that credential was going to look like. So we worked together and developed a credential schema uh, identified what the flow would be uh, between ATB and the consumer and then TELUS, and then what the proof request and proof request schema would look like from TELUS. So we did that um, and that really helped us understand the flow and the communications between each of the entities. And then the next thing we did was um, have TELUS issue a change of address credential to the consumer. So this is a situation where TELUS has physical knowledge of the consumer changing address because they've now hooked up a, a telephone line at a new location. So they uh, felt that they could be in a, a trusted position to issue that credential to the consumer. So we, again, we developed a, a change of address schema uh, for the credential and then for the proof request uh, to A to B. So again, this was really large, the first part, largely a paper exercise of going through and understanding what those credentials look like, how the schemas were structured, and what the flow in the business uh, exchange would look like between those organizations. So at that time, you know, this was the the level of um, kind of interface we were dealing with. So, you know, command line uh, prompts that we're dealing with um, and issuing the schemas to the ledger, making the requests and and such. but. In doing so, this didn't add a lot of value when it came to actually sharing the story you know, across the organization. But within our team and within TELUS's team, it definitely demonstrated the potential of this system and how we could use it to really start to exchange these credentials, define what those credentials could be. So this was a kind of an important first step for us in really truly understanding the, the basics of the technology and what the flow would look like. <clears throat> So the next opportunity we had um, came to us through IBM. They were organizing a, another proof of concept. Um, in this case, 
what we were looking at was the issuing of a employment credential along with the issuance of a driver's license credential <clears throat> and using those two credentials to present to ATB for the purposes of account opening again. So in this case, uh, the interesting thing was um, having Workday involved. So Workday was uh, providing the employee portal. So the employees logging into their IBM employment portal that is powered by Workday. So this is more of a real world uh, scenario. And what it also helped to demonstrate was the relationship uh, from a controller processor perspective between IBM as the employer in this case, uh, being the controller of the system information and Workday who's operating the portal on behalf of IBM being the processor. So in this case, we went through again, <clears throat> developed what those schemas would look like for the credentials uh, for the employment uh, credential as well as the driver's license credential. And then the proof request, in this case, it was a compound proof request, um, retrieving attributes both from the individual's uh, employment history and their uh, government issued driver's license. So that's what the proof request contained for ATB in this case. From there, okay, and here's the, so this proof of concept for us um, became more real world. In both cases, um, we were, doing the transactions, the TELUS project and this project with IBM and Workday, the transactions were being communicated across the sovereign ledger or the test ledger. And, uh, but in this case with the IBM Workday project, uh, we were actually using uh, proper web interfaces um, for the Workday portal, as well as a proper uh, digital identity wallet. In this case, we were able to test out the Evernim digital identity wallet. So in the background, we see the employee portal uh, where they're issuing a credential. So this is an employee logged into their portal and they've requested that credential be sent to their wallet. And then uh, we see that the IBM uh, screen there in the wallet where it says IBM is offering you employment and it shows the uh, few of the fields there that are contained within that employment credential. And then the screen on the right shows it um, A to B is requesting uh, this information from the individual. So again, the credential being issued into the consumer's wallet and then the proof request being made from A to B to the consumer and that appearing in their wallet as well. So in both cases, you see with the wallet, there's the opportunity for the individual to accept <clears throat> or ignore it or send it or ignore it. So that's an important um, aspect when we consider the self-sovereign flow of credentials. <clears throat> the next piece we did in that proof of concept with IBM was for A to B to again, issue back to the consumer a credential that contained their banking information. So now they had a record in their uh, digital credential wallet of their bank account with ATB. So now that, that credential could be shared, um, for example, back to uh, IBM for payroll for direct deposit. Uh, so now the consumer has that bank account credential stored directly in their wallet and are able to use it going forward with uh, scenarios like that. We also were able to uh, demonstrate how the consumer could log into their ATB online banking using a credential as well. So in this case, uh, we actually <clears throat> had the consumer go to the ATB online banking or a simulated version of it and uh, enter in their account number. And that then made a push to their wallet requesting um, confirmation that they were trying to log into their online banking. Then in the digital wallet, they confirmed that and that was then sent back to the online banking and they were successfully able to log in to their online banking portal using that credential and the digital wallet experience. So a couple of important um, aspects here was, you know, both the uh, controller processor relationship between IBM and Workday. Again, the compound proof request that was coming from uh, the wallet to ATB for the account opening, the bank account being stored back in the wallet. <clears throat> and then again, using the uh, credential to 
uh, log into the ATB online banking. So we thought that these were you know, all quite critical pieces that we were able to successfully demonstrate uh, through this project. So we were able to then move forward and, uh, and there's the bank account credential being shared. So from there, um, for ATB... Just, yeah. Mike, just one little question coming in here from um, Ify. He's asking, um, are you guys part of any POC where integration of other Hyperledger products, projects like Fabric are happening? Yes, we're um, <clears throat> within our um, innovation team. We're also currently working on two Fabric-based initiatives. In that case, we are <clears throat> building a payment engine that's connected to a, a node that we're running on a couple of fabric networks. The opportunity for us there is to provide payment services for uh, fabric-based networks. So we are doing some work in the fabric world as well. Great, and mm -hmm. Ife is also asking, um, how do you compare Identity Mixer with SSI? Um, so I probably not an expert on the identity mixer side. Um, so maybe defer that question to the community or if there's others that okay. want to well, contribute we to that. Can do, we can do a webinar, uh, um, an SSI meetup in the future about that. So I'm just going to sure. skip that. Question. And if anyone else has any questions, please just share them in the, in the question tool and I'll, I'll be bringing it up. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. Thank you. So with the, those couple of projects behind us, um, we also, uh, based on our kind of comfort and the direction things were going, we became a sovereign steward. Uh, so we became a sovereign steward about a year and a half ago. And if you're familiar with the sovereign network, uh, the stewards are able to basically operate the validator nodes <clears throat> as guided and directed by the sovereign foundation. So um, we are actively involved there as well. So. All this work that we've been doing um, has been leading towards what we're currently working on, which is uh, we think that we have a kind of a unique opportunity due to our size and our geography. Um, as I mentioned before, ATB operates within the province of Alberta within Canada. And Alberta has a population of about 4 million people. And what we think this allows for is a, a fairly contained marketplace or an ecosystem where we can move quite quickly and aggressively in adopting the concept of self-sovereign identity. And that's where, so ATB, our focus is the province of Alberta. So what we've done <clears throat> is we identified, you know, what would the critical experience look like or the typical experience look like for uh, residents in the province of Alberta. And what we thought it would be is, you know, <clears throat> they'd be interacting with organizations like um, universities, telcos, utilities, insurance companies, municipal government, provincial government, and banks like ATB. And in a day-to-day -day way, these are the typical organizations uh, across the province that people would be interacting with and also ones that they interact with whereby um, there is currently some exchange of a, of a trusted credential although currently it's you know in paper or plastic forms. So we went through um, early on and basically wrote out a number of scenarios um, for how a, a typical uh, Albertan would interact with these types of organizations. We identified kind of seven or eight uh, flows for each organization. And for each of those, then we identified what the schemas would be. So we just, <clears throat> on our own part, we defined what all that would work would be just as a starting point. That way we could go to the, the industry and um, others around the province and share with them our vision. So, you know, we believe that A to B by itself can't move forward with self-sovereign identity um, and just try to get it out there in the marketplace. It's a multi-sided marketplace where you need to have both issuers um, of credentials, the consumers engaged, and verifiers of the credentials who are receiving those credentials for whatever business purpose. So, again, we went through and defined all this, um, created some documents that we were then able to, to start to go and have meetings with each of these different organizations. So, we started meeting with universities and 
telcos and insurance um, insurance companies, utilities, just on a one <clears throat> one to one basis to start with to help share with them what our vision was for how we see this moving forward for the province and, and why we thought it was such a significant opportunity for us. We um, were able to then convene a couple of workshops uh, in early December last year. Uh, at that <clears throat> point, we had 14 organizations engaged um, in those workshops, we ran two one-day workshops. And the purpose of the workshops was to do a deeper dive into uh, what self-sovereign identity was and what this uh, ecosystem opportunity was within the province of Alberta and why we thought it was so important. So we went through in that workshop, uh, walked through what all the scenarios were and what the benefits for each of the organizations were and, and more importantly, what the benefits for the province would be if we could move forward with this <clears throat> concept quite broadly. So the workshops went quite well. We had, as I mentioned, 14 organizations involved, um, about 40 individuals representing those organizations and uh, very robust discussions and, and a significant amount of excitement. We also separately ran a, a meetup the day before the first workshop and we had about 65 people in attendance there, just a more, uh, a broader community of people uh, from our, in the city of Calgary to come out and understand what the potential was for this. So what we're trying to create um, with the Alberta Credentials Ecosystem is a, a real marketplace of issuers and verifiers of those credentials to help demonstrate what the, the value could be for the individual Albertan and for these organizations. The, you know, with each of the organizations we engage with as well, we also identified that they are all also employers. So each of those organizations we've had discussions with our employers and could also issue an employment credential or receive an employment credential for the purpose of uh, onboarding a new employee. Uh, so basically from the ecosystem uh, workshops we ran, uh, we've now got uh, about 10 or 12 of those organizations engaged in further discussions. And what we're working towards is where in uh, March timeframe, we wanna be more actively moving forward with these organizations and begin doing uh, targeted POCs with each of them. So the, the goal there is that each of the organizations can start to engage with others uh, around the province to better understand what the, the flows would be uh, between each of the organizations. Um, I have another question coming up here from, from Ify, and he's asking, how, how do you measure the performance for, S, for an SSI a PO, POC project uh, when you have multiple validators and, issuer, and issuers? So in the, the first um, <clears throat> two proof of concepts we did, they were you know, learning exercises to help build our understanding and, and depth of knowledge around how it worked and <clears throat> set the foundation or validate our kind of assumptions on how it was gonna work and where we saw the value. Now with this Alberta Credentials Ecosystem, <clears throat> our expectation is we'll be running multiple POCs and the purpose of those individual POCs again will be to validate for each of the organizations involved um, what the potential is and how really to build their knowledge up. Again, ATB has been working at this for almost two years um, and many of these other organizations we're engaging with are brand new to the topic of self-sovereign identity <clears throat> and in particular with the sovereign network. So the first um, round of POCs will really be focused on knowledge building and proving out um, basically how the flows work and the potential for each of the organizations. From there, we want to identify a key set of um, exchanges that'll take place. And with the, if we look forward um, a bit further to when we would roll this out to our customers and, and Albertans, um, <clears throat> quite reasonably an initial rollout might be targeted at a a younger demographic, somebody in their 20s, maybe a recent graduate um, who's 
at a point where they're going to be going through um, many new life experiences, whether it's um, getting utilities for a new property, opening up new bank accounts, um, getting new telco accounts, getting insurance for their vehicle. Each one of these things, there's going to be a higher frequency of interaction. So what we want to identify at that point is who are the organizations that are ready and able to um, go into production or at least limited production with this? And what are the uh, credentials that we'll be able to issue as individual organizations? And what are the, the proofs that we'll be wanting to make um, to receive from the individuals? <clears throat> Okay, um, I, Alf is also asking as a follow-up question, what is the throughput you're targeting um, for this POC? Um, <clears throat> there's no specific targets around throughputs for the POC. Um, as I mentioned, they're more focused on um, demonstrating the flows and the business value. Um, one of the things I'll just kind of add is that the, the great thing from my perspective of the work I'm able to do is that there are so many other individuals and organizations globally working on different aspects of this, whether it's, you know, within Hyperledger uh, itself, within the Indy working groups um, and all the great work taking place there, or specifically within the Sovereign Foundation and the various working groups in the Sovereign Foundation. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that um, I find quite appealing is the, the very diverse and vast uh, number of contributors to this broader global ecosystem, each working at solving um, individual pieces of the, the puzzle uh, that's necessary for the future success of self-sovereign identity. So, you know, on the technical side within Hyperledger Indy, uh, there's lots of great work that's being done and uh, Alex has been able to cover off a lot of that um, with people who's had <clears throat> on board through this uh, webinar series. But there's all that great work. And then you get the work of the likes of Drummond and such within the Sovereign Foundation um, and Evernim, but specifically in the Sovereign Foundation around the, the governance framework that's being developed. Uh, so there's, my point is that what's important for me is to kind of be aware of what's going on uh, throughout the identity ecosystem and understand who's working on which pieces because ATB as a whole can't <clears throat> contribute to or move forward every single piece of the puzzle, but rather uh, we can do our part in helping move things forward. So um, things like specific things like throughput, um, we aren't testing and uh, at this point in these, in these proof of concepts, we would um, be relying on looking to to others more on the technical side of things with Indian sovereign. Uh, and again, we're engaged with and, and monitoring those developments, but they're not something that we're explicitly doing and they aren't the focus of the objectives of the exercises we're, we're currently going through. Great. Um, just one last question from Ivy. Um, he's asking, what are the challenges or bottlenecks you have seen while working with uh, with close to real world data for, for this POC? So far as um, bottlenecks, <clears throat> really the, you know, we haven't run into any specific bottlenecks. Um, what we're you know, well aware of is some of the, the technical limitations that are, you know, currently being worked on, um, such things as um, key management and key recovery um, are, are critical pieces that are, you know, being worked on by others um, in the ecosystem. So there's many different kind of levels of um, technical pieces that are being worked on that I think are <clears throat> the broader limitations. And, um, but we know that um, those are all well underway and during the timelines that we're working towards uh, will be solved and, and resolved. And we're again, monitoring them quite closely. And I'll touch on that a, a couple more slides around another project that we currently have underway. Okay, I have um, 
I mean, plenty of questions today. Just one more question coming here from Joaquin. And um, I mean, I just kind of rephrase this a little bit um, um, to, to, to make it a little bit more understandable for myself. So basically, he's asking like, if we have issuers, holders, and verifiers, and um, and an ATB customer like a holder, I mean, he has shared his 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 credential with another institution. How can the verifier validate that the issuer is effectively ATB? What if somebody else fakes, I mean, um, Joaquin is writing certificate saying that they are ATB, can I verify that? Right, and um, there's a lot of work um, currently being done around the, the concept of the web of trust, and uh, <clears throat> that is um, and a very important feature and component of the success of this type of network. And I, again, I'd say that's one of the pieces that's currently um, being worked on and developed. And the basic concept there is that how do I, so if I'm uh, going back to the previous example, TELUS <clears throat> and receiving a credential that says it was signed by ATB, how do I know that to be true? And um, my understanding is that the expectations there are um, in some ways going to reflect um, certain aspects of a, a DNS type scenario, um, whereby somebody's going to maintain a list of the, I believe it would be the public keys of the various organizations. So you would know that in my list, these are the, the keys I expect um, for ATB to have signed this credential. <clears throat> um, I'm not an expert in that particular area, but it, I know it is a very significant one and one that will be emerging. So if we look at the Alberta ecosystem and as we start this um, rolling out, we may we may start with a dozen organizations who are participating in this ecosystem and we may expect that to you know grow to 20 or 30 or 50 in a period while it's being rolled out during that time frame we'll be able to um, have fairly good control over um, who the participants are and what their uh, keys are to make sure that when we receive credentials we can be quite certain but again as i mentioned there's a lot of moving parts and that's a very critical one that we will uh, ensure is well understood and well tested uh, prior to broader and broader adoption of the solution across the network. Great. These are the questions for the time being. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Next um, diagram I just want to show. Second. Yes. Um, so this is just a, a quick diagram, just trying to demonstrate you know the network. Uh, effect here, and I think I've got about the green dots here are kind of nine different um, organizations, kind of representing telcos, utilities, and post-secondaries. And blue dots, there's a hundred blue dots on here representing Alberta citizens. And all I wanted to show here was kind of, you know, here's a blue dot and their relationship with four of the diff four of the organizations, and they have received or have sent credentials between these organizations. And this is a very simplified, oversimplified diagram, but it's meant to demonstrate if we imagine now, um, you know, 50 organizations issuing credentials and maybe they're issuing, you know, five or 10 different types of credentials and receiving, you know, verifying five or 10 different types of credentials. And we've got a million, million Albertans engaged in the system and 50 organizations. You know, these diagrams start to become quite, um, complex, but that complexity to me is the excitement of what is possible. So again, you know, going from this, you know, 100, or, 100 individuals and nine organizations, you know, showing one relationship or one individual's relationship with four different organizations and the flow of credentials between them. To me, this is the exciting power of um, what we're going to create and why this fairly closed ecosystem of our province um, is an exciting <clears throat> um, sandbox for us to start to get this going and for us to very successfully move forward quickly 
um, to the point where we could have a million people uh, live with their credentials exchanging with multiple organizations um, within the next couple of years. <clears throat> the next project I want to touch on is what we're calling a, a wallet study. And A to B uh, initiated this project last fall. Uh, we engaged a couple of other Canadian companies and are working with a, a consultant. And together, the four of us um, are going through and um, identified what are the key aspects of this wallet. And from a wallet, we're considering it to be this, you know, potentially a, an app uh, where an individual or a consumer can you know, receive and manage their various credentials with the various organizations that they're engaged with. To me, this is a very critical piece of the puzzle and one that today isn't very well solved. Um, there are lots of examples of um, digital wallets in the cryptocurrency space. And as we all know, there's varying degrees of um, user experience within those wallets. And they also um, struggle with the same issue that a digital identity wallet is around key management. So we identified the need for this wallet study to really <clears throat> take the temperature on where the marketplace currently is and identify what are all the key features and functionality required in a digital identity wallet and what's the current state of those features? Which of those features would we want to be in an MVP um, rollout of a wallet to real customers? And what are the features that would need to come uh, shortly afterwards in order to make <clears throat> the wallet a very robust experience for uh, the individual? So this study we've been conducting for the past uh, three months uh, will be published in early February. Uh, so we have done it in a way where we'll be releasing this publicly uh, so that we can help contribute to the community um, and contribute to everybody's understanding as to where wallets currently are and what some of the key features and functionality are that we believe are necessary for a successful <clears throat> wallet uh, utilization in the marketplace as we roll this out. So, you know, things in there, you know, such things as key management, key recovery, um, guardianship, uh, integration with, you know, crypto tokens, if that's possible or necessary. Uh, there's a whole different, whole wide range of um, aspects that will be covered off in this wallet study. So we, we thought it was important to get ahead of, <clears throat> get ahead of this issue or uh, situation and start to identify where things are at, who the key players are, and not wait until we're ready to go to market uh, with consumers. As I showed in the IBM Workday project, uh, we're currently working with the Evernim wallet, and you know we're a part of the Evernim Accelerator program, which gets us um, the ability to work closely with Evernim and the products we're developing. But you know we need to <clears throat> make sure that we fully understand what that wallet should be and how it should work and uh, what's going to be necessary in order for us to bring this forward to our customers when we're ready to do, do so. So that report will be published within the next uh, two or three weeks uh, in early, early February. So what's next um, <clears throat> for ATB and the Alberta ecosystem um, really is working very closely with these other organizations. As I said, there's about 10 or 12 now that are are quite keenly interested in, in working with us. So we're gonna nurture that community, um, help raise everybody's level of knowledge and understanding as to the, the power and potential uh, of self-sovereign identity and, and verified credentials and how we can actually move it forward. Uh, one of the important aspects of the workshops we held in December was uh, we actually had all three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal government uh, participate in the workshop. And the federal government was able to very articulately uh, confirm the alignment of what we're doing with their overall expectations for identity uh, within Canada. So that 
confirmation from the federal government that what we're doing is is well aligned with their expectations was quite an important aspect of what we're doing as well. And uh, so really what we're doing here is trying to move that forward and get the, the entire province um, marching forward in the same direction. <clears throat> Next aspect of what we'll be doing is around um, our internal integrations. So understanding if we're issuing a credential or receiving a, a proof, what are our internal systems that those things will be connecting into? So that's a, a next piece that we'll be embarking on shortly. And that'll allow us to better understand uh, as we go more closer and closer to production, what those integration points will be, uh, what the significance of those integration efforts will be and what the user experiences will be that we can create um, from our internal or existing systems. As mentioned, the wallet analysis uh, will be done shortly, uh, but later on this year, we'll also be embarking on kind of wallet selection or wallet <clears throat> uh, verification, ensuring that there's at least one wallet that we're comfortable taking out to our customers uh, to which we'd be comfortable issuing a uh, credential to. So for us, that's a very important um, aspect. So we'll be you know, going through an exercise of selecting you know, one or more wallets that we're comfortable uh, doing initial production level rollout to our customers with, and that'll be taking place later this year as well. And then a pilot rollout um, we'll be targeting uh, fourth quarter of this year or first quarter of next year, where we'll actually be getting out in front of real life customers along with the other participants in the Alberta ecosystem and actually uh, doing this in a live production way and providing, demonstrating more and more value to the ecosystem and to the consumers. <clears throat> and an important aspect of that as well that we'll be working on this year is the overall communication, how do we effectively communicate that story to consumers? You know, one challenge sometimes is that being in the space and uh, deep in it, <clears throat> the language we use and the approach we take is very, um, I guess, technically focused. And we need to make sure we can have the language we use make sense to a typical consumer. So they see the value in, in the exchanges that we're doing. So That'll be another aspect we'll be working on throughout this year as well. So, so those are the main key pieces we'll be working on kind of throughout uh, 2019. And that'll really help set us up for success, we believe, in rolling out to Albertans. So that's the end of the formal part of the presentation. I just wanted to check and see if there's any more questions of coming, Alex. Yeah, uh, we, we have plenty. Um, so um, let me let, let, let me start with them. Like, I'm just going to start directly with the last one that there was about um, wallets. So I, I was asking, like, do you think educating the concept of wallets um, is challenging um, uh, for, for the whole SSI ecosystem and for real world users? And what form of wallets do you think are the best to practice for SSI? <clears throat> yeah, I think the kind of the education um, to the consumers of, of what a wallet is and how they'll use it um, is a very critical piece to the success of this. And as I mentioned, there I think there'll be a lot of work for us to get that language and that experience refined. Uh, so that it is easy to understand and easy to demonstrate to people what the value <clears throat> is and why they would bother doing this. So that will be an important aspect of the work we're doing. And what was the second part of the question, Alex? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if I'm phrasing it correctly. If not, Ify, please just insert your text again. Um, if um, how, how to make those um, wallets practical or how, how are they like um yeah and my understanding is, uh, um, is that how to make them practical and use um what wallets do you recommend to try ssi right yeah i think that's a an important exercise that as an entire community we need to go through 
um, over the next number of months is, you know, I think right now the wallets that we're seeing are, you know, functionally um, able to do what we need them to do on a basic level. Um, still lots more functionality to come, but the basic idea of um, issuing and receiving a credential into a wallet um, is there, but you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done by the community. And you know, the great thing about Sovereign and Hyperledger Indie is that the open source nature of it. Uh, so you may have you know, brand new entrants who come into the market and create a brand new wallet, or you may have um, existing uh, people in the ecosystem, whether they're other digital identity wallets um, or systems or potentially crypto currency wallets who pivot and either expand or pivot their offering to a, a dandy based wallet. So I think it's a exciting thing that um, will be happening over the next 12 months. Great. Um, Pierre is asking, um, the banks lost a payment wallet war. What, uh, why going the wallet way again for identity? Right, a oh, great question. Um, and just a bit of our thinking over the last couple of years, early on, we were thinking that the identity wallet could be something that we could white label or might want to white label so that you would go into your ATB branded identity wallet and we could potentially um, embed that within our mobile banking uh, app experience. Our current thinking is more towards we would not own that um, identity wallet experience, but rather we would participate in one in that it's up to the consumer to you know, select the wallet that they want to work with. The important thing we've kind of identified or our current thinking is that we likely need to have some way of verifying that we trust a wallet. So um, whether it's some certification, <clears throat> I think as an industry or community at, at large, uh, that's going to be a bit of what will happen, which is to say um, this one or these five or these 10 wallets um, are, are trusted wallets uh, because we don't necessarily want to be issuing a wallet, sorry, issuing a credential or receiving a credential from a wallet that potentially um, exposes our customers to risk. So again, that's a emerging uh, line of thinking, but this wallet study and the work over the next number of months will help inform uh, those decisions and directions a lot more. Okay, I have one more question here about wallets. Um, does ADP support development of an open standard for inter interoperable wallets like DKMS, Decentralized Key Management System? That's the direction we would um, currently be going towards is um, a wallet that does support. So key management period is a, a very important aspect of um, the wallet. And current thinking is that um, DKMS is uh, a very valid way and approach for um, helping consumers manage their keys. So current thinking is yes towards DKMS and supporting that as a, as a valid approach for consumers to manage their keys. Great. Um, another question from Joaquin, but also from other people that had similar questions. Um, um, how many organizations would you like to engage with initially in, in this ecosystem to get started with like five, 10, 50? And which ones do you, would you like to go first with? And um, how, how, how are you approaching these, these organizations to join this decentralized digital identity ecosystem? Yeah, no, that's a great um, question. Ideally, at this point, you know, I'd say in the order of 10 to 12. Um, and again, the, the thinking and logic behind that is how do we, what's, you know, if you think of a Venn diagram of intersecting circles of, of you know, the populations that either, each organization deals with, um, we think that if we had that number, at least to start with, 
we would be able to get enough um, valid use cases of credentials flowing to at least do some initial um, consumer level validation of the value proposition and why this would be important. You know, shortly after that, it'd be great to get to 20, 30, 50 organizations involved. The, the challenge and the balance right now is um, there are so many scenarios and use cases of how we could use um, verified credentials. Uh, however, we need to focus right now on the very high, um, the ones that will impact the largest population if that makes sense, uh, in order to kind of get adoption going and get testing going. There are, you know, dozens or hundreds of different use cases, but the specifics and the population that they might impact um, early on would be quite low. And therefore, because what we're doing right now is really um, gradual and incremental validation of the, the system and the value proposition, uh, focusing on those smaller use cases early on, um, we don't think is of as high value. So that's why, you know, right now we're focusing on about a dozen different organizations. If there's more organizations, but they're still kind of in the same um, family of organizations, focus on the same um, experiences for the consumer, that's fine. Uh, we also didn't want to be in a situation where we were trying to you know, educate 50 organizations within the province all at once and trying to um, have that set our timelines. I would rather work with the 10 or 12 who are most keen and most willing to um, experiment and, and go down this journey with us uh, without overly impacting the timelines and our ability to move quickly. Wonderful. Um, Pierre is asking, how does HB approach um, identity differently to other Canadian banks? And I'm just going to add one or two more questions, which are maybe a little bit related to this. I would also like to know, like, how come that ADB is so forward thinking, at least that's my perception with the European perspective on things where I don't see banks like um, being so forward thinking as, as ATB seems to be. And, um, and, um, yeah, so basically those two things like um, how, how are you different with other banks in Canada, but also what do you think makes you different um, as ATB, as your bank? Is it because you're a public institution or, or is there, are there some other factors? Um, so I think within Canada, there's a lot of great work happening in this space, um, specifically on the, you know, the Hyperledger Indy and, and Sovereign approach. Um, <clears throat> the BC government and Ontario governments are doing a lot of work in this space. Um, specifically, they're uh, focusing a bit more on the organization or business um, use cases, um, but they are very progressive in the space. Secondly, within Canada, <clears throat> there's an organization called DIAC, and I'm going to forget what the acronym is right now, but um, DIAC, D-I-A-C-C, uh, has been working uh, for a number of years now creating what's called the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework. <clears throat> so that trust framework um, is an important um, guideline for how corporations and governments can work together with respect to um, identity and the expectations uh, in that space. So. Again, that's another piece of great work that's taking place and in Canada, um, that Pan-Canadian Trust Framework has been identified globally, I think as being a, <clears throat> a fairly forward thinking uh, initiative and uh, being used as a benchmark for other, other regions globally as well. Um, with respect to other Canadian banks, um, the kind of big five banks as we call them in Canada, um, who are, you know, large global banks as well, um, Royal Bank of Canada, uh, Bank of Montreal, TD Bank. These are all some of our larger banks in Canada. They're also very um, progressive and working hard towards digital identity. The, the difference right now I'd say is that they're focused more on a federated approach. Um, 
whereby the banks are central to that sharing of the identity and the ecosystem. So versus ATB's approach is more towards a self-sovereign model. And again, back to the um, ATB story at the beginning of my presentation, where uh, again, focused on the happiness of our burdens and the <clears throat> how we can impact their lives. Uh, I believe that this approach um, versus more of a bank centric approach um, can lead to greater impact for consumers. And, you know, the great thing that I love about being a part of this community is that, you know, there are great people globally working on this. And that's what, you know, is exciting for us is that we're a part of, you know, this global movement. What allows ATB to move quicker and, and be progressive in this space? I think our size, we're, we reasonably see ourselves as a bit of a sweet spot. Uh, we're not too big and we're not um, dealing with cross international borders. So that allows us to kind of stay focused. We also are <clears throat> quite aggressive in our pursuit of using technology to transform our business. So it's a, a very key piece of what we're doing, whether it's process automation or a number of other initiatives that we're involved in a to B is working very aggressively to ensure um, the transformation of our core technology and things like soft sovereign identity are critical to that. Right. Um, like, would it be fair to say that um, um, that because of your public nature, you you have like a more social responsibility outlook in regards to identity? And differently to like, if you take for example the uh, the Scandinavian countries like um, Sweden or Finland, where where banks have kind of taken like a dominant role in in, in, in ident as a centralized identity provider for working together with governments, um, that you're taking a different way um, compared to other banks overall. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it's funny within ATB we don't feel or operate. <clears throat> um, or think we operate much like a, a government related organization. Although, you know, we do have the freedom of not having, you know, quarterly shareholders that we're having or shareholders that we're having to do, you know, quarterly um, performance you know, and profitability reporting to. But that said, ATB is very focused on being profitable. And um, so maybe in reality, some of those pressures aren't um, quite the same, but we are as much um, focused on profit and and growth and potential. We just believe that uh, in order to be sustainable long term, that we need to be very aggressive on the technology front, and we see this as being a very key piece. And if if, if we take this like with a company like Talus, like because like at least what I have observed is that. There has been like a constant battlefield identity between telecom companies and and banks, and 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 you have managed to work together with another telecom company um, like Telus in in, in 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 creating this. Is like how how um, did did they have like just the same DNA, the same outlook, or how how did you guys work together in, in getting to something like that? I think um, so. Some of the people at Telus we deal with are. Um, very engaged with that Pan Canadian Trust framework. Um, have been very active in in its development. So, what we, you know, between ourselves and Telus, I think there is a a bit of a shared philosophy around um, a very consumer centric model, and that together we can create a a powerful experience for consumers. So I think there is strong alignment from that perspective, and. Maybe it's a matter of there's, you know, it's not a threatening relationship <clears throat> um, for us. It's one where it's quite symbiotic. And um, again, we see that there's, you know, three legs to the stool of this success, you know, the consumer, the issuers and the verifiers of these credentials. And uh, we believe in the the value of the, the final outcome and that our roles um, are quite critical to make that happen. Awesome. I have a couple of more questions, but I think we're kind of running out of time, so I don't want to see more of your time. When will the, the, the study about wallets be available? Where can people find it? Yeah, um, I think you know, early to mid-February, it should be uh, 
finalized. And so far as where to find it, um, we'll be trying to share it as broadly um, as possible, but obviously through various social media, um, <clears throat> either myself or uh, I guess if you follow myself, it's probably the most um, obvious thing to say, but we'll be getting it out there as broadly as we can. Uh, we'll be sharing it, I'm sure. Sovereign and Evernim will be sharing it. Um, yeah. Nice. No explicit point, no explicit point where it's being published to, but okay. as broadly we'll, as we can. For sure, from SSI Meetup, I, I would love to do um, an SSI Meetup about that um, study you've done. That would be really amazing. Um, thank you so much, um, Mike, for, for joining us today. Um, um, like a week ago, we had Tim Boma. Um, and we will continue in, in this first quarter of 2019 and having the, the main leaders of digital identity from Canada um, sharing their knowledge and ideas with us. Um, I mean, Canada, Canada is really one of the top places of the world to learn about decentralized digital identity. We have upcoming Daryl O'Donnell, who will be talking about CU Ledger. We have upcoming John Jordan from the British Columbian government um, talking about um, um, BON, which is a solution they have developed that is running in production already. We have Andrew Johnson from Talos in the future also coming in. So plenty of other people um, and that are all related to Tim Boma and, and Mike, and they all work together. And um, Mike, it, it was a pleasure to have you here with us today. Any final words you would, you would like to share? No, I just uh, thank you, Alex, for, for organizing these. And um, everybody, if there's questions, reach out. Um, you can reach me on Twitter, it's probably easiest. Excellent. Um, we'll share that on, on, on the blog post. If you want to learn more about future and upcoming webinars from SSI Meetup, just sign up to our newsletter on our website, ssimeetup.org, or join our Telegram channel, follow us on Twitter. And Mike, thank you very much. I'll be uploading this as soon as possible um, with the video and the presentation. And it was a pleasure to have you here with us. And it's, it was really, really interesting to see that they're like so forward-thinking banks like ATB and the work you're doing is excellent. Great. Thank you, Alex.